Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always an honour to talk to you guys. Uh, as a Lancastrian, I'll put, I'll put that out there now. So <laughs> yeah, I know I'm not going to get out of that, so it's okay. Right, what I would like to do today is um, talk about the, uh, the comparative wounds, uh, or the comparison between the wounds uh, exhibited on Richard III skeleton and those uh, discovered at Tau, uh, which first excavated the grave in September 1996, so it's a long time ago. So uh, anyway, without further ado, but also I'll have a, a little bit of an introduction because as you'll see in a minute, a very strange things happened on the way here almost, but it was over the last couple of days. So let's get on with it. And also, initially I've put a, 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 quite a large amount of text up. So if you can't hear too well, or oh, it's pretty good in this room, but you should be able to read it as well. Anyway. Let's see what happens. So, uh, as I was preparing for this presentation, I was looking through my computer data and came across a note in my diary on a relevant date. You'll see what the date is in a minute. Uh, on that day, on the 4th of the 2nd, 2013, I had arrived at the Department of Archaeology at the University of York and found that I had just received an email from CNN TV, no less. Uh, they wanted to give me an interview uh, about the skeleton of King Richard III, which obviously was uh, hot news on that day. Little did I know how hot it was going to be. Um, I checked with the department because I knew that some of the members of staff were working on the DNA analysis. They said that there was a specific, specific list of staff who were not allowed to comment on it. But I wasn't on it. <laughs> so I can say what I want, basically. Which was enlightening, but... Uh, You've got to be careful in academia. I contacted CNN and they started to talk to a member of staff, and I started to talk to a member of staff. Would I comment on the thoughts of the skeleton, she said. Yes, I would, I said. <laughs> <laughs> what did I think, she asked. I thought that the evidence for it being Richard was overwhelming, uh, but it needed positive proof, because after all, I'm an academic. We, we demand these things. Fantastic, she said. Please start the interview by saying these exact words. We will give you your cue when the interview begins. I was about to go on CNN, worldwide TV. <laughs> my moment had come. <laughs> I set up my laptop to work on the, uh, oops, there's a bit of thing in the top of the screen, uh, to work with, uh, in front of CNN, and sat in front of the camera. All I saw was a small image. You imagine this is my laptop, and I've got a little image of me in the corner, and that's all I could see. So I didn't know I was live or not on CNN TV. I was primed to start the interview. I waited, staring at the blank screen as you are doing here. <laughs> and waited. <laughs> and I waited some more. <laughs> Nothing. No comment, no advice, no smoke. I waited longer. This is CNN TV. I'm about to go worldwide. What's happened? How very odd. <laughs> What to do? Do I just sit there and for how long do I sit there? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I think it was about 15 minutes, half an hour, I was just sitting in front of a blank screen. Meanwhile, 100 miles to the south of the earth to admit, at that exact same moment, can you imagine what's happened? Certain people were actually there, so certain people know. This was happening. <laughs> So I was abandoned by CNN for a very good reason, actually. And that's they had other things on their mind on that day. So, live television footage from the University of Leicester confirming that their DNA results proved. Oops, hello, who's done that? You did it. The host would like you to. I'd like you to start speaking. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll continue anyway. Uh, proved that the bones were, and found in Leicester, were indeed those of Richard III. England's last Plantagenet king. And the rest, as they say, is history. And obviously we don't need to go into all the details now about what happened on that day and the subsequent days. However, it was all, all was not lost because, as an, as an aside, our town research was also mentioned in the press release on that day. Do Appleby, the archaeologist who excavated uh, the skeleton of Richard, um, also gave a presentation, and she very kindly mentioned that the uh, Richard's 
still can perform it rather trauma richer scale and have been uh, compared with the trauma on the individuals from the town of Musgrave which we found in 1996. Part of that analysis by the University of Leicester Richard Skelton had been compared to the individuals found in a Musgrave in 1996 who died in the Battle of Town as these exhibited extensive weapon trauma. So why am I discussing the medieval weapon trauma on the skeleton, skeleton of Richard III? Uh, because Richard's skeleton was compared to those from town, basically. So that's why I'm here talking today. Um, but I'm also the director of the Town Battlefield Archaeology Project. And it was a town, as some of you also know, uh, on the 29th of March 1461, that Richard's elder, older brother, uh, Edward, uh, beat the Lancashire army in order to become King Edward IV, thus becoming, uh, beginning, uh, the beginning of the Yorkist dynasty. So again, it's slightly convoluted, but that's why it all happened in the first place. And because we can categorically say if there was no victory for the Yorkists at the Battle of Town, there would be no Yorkist dynasty, and if there was no Yorkist dynasty, there would be no King Richard III. It's as simple as that. So that's why it's all sort of linked. Uh, so going back a little bit uh, from today, in 2010, as you all know, I'm talking to experts here anyway, um, uh, Glenn Ford and his team found the, the uh, mainly cannonballs, etc., from uh, the battlefield of Bosworth, which proved categorically where the battlefield was. And then obviously, as you know even more, in 2012, the skeleton of Richard III, who died at Bosworth, uh, was rediscovered in Leicester. Uh, at this point, I'd like to thank the University of Leicester because I'm going to uh, unashamedly borrow some of their slides, because at the moment, I still believe this is the only set of photographs you can do anything with uh, for the Ricardian uh, data. So, the, the, the important question is, uh, is the archaeological evidence of weapon trauma on King Richard III's skeleton significantly different to that of other medieval battlefield victims? So, we've got the highest person in the land dying on the medieval battlefield. Why should it be the same as everybody else who's dying on the medieval battlefield? And obviously, here's the masquerade from town that we excavated in 1996. That sunshine's made it a little bit faded, but anyway, we'll, uh, hopefully you can see that better than I can. Uh, and there's a slight background history of Tappan. Uh, there it is. Where's it going down? There is the city of York, and Tappan is 10 miles to the southwest. Uh, hopefully, as you also know, but to those who don't, Tappan was a battle fought during the Wars of the Roses between the uh, current, then current king, Henry VI, and the up and coming uh, Yorkist Edward, who later became King Edward IV. It's not my dinner today, is it? <laughs> <laughs> right, um, there's the, uh, my excavation from the Masquerade of 1996 with them all replaced in, in their original uh, positions within that grave. Uh, and scientifically, we know that there are a minimum number of individuals of 38 plus. Uh, now, this is only part of the mass grave. The builders disturbed the first half. So I think there's somewhere between 45 and 50. Uh, we never got to see the first half of the grave. Uh, and they're reburied in Saxon churchyard, so we thought they'd never be uh, But also, today I'd like to show you some of the new evidence from Tappan that was not included in the original analysis by the University of Leicester. Because they analysed these skeletons from the they compared them with the skeletons from the mass grave from 1996. These are the skeletons that were found after that. Uh, the first one was from uh, 2002, and this individual was found half buried under Town Hall. There's the wall of Town Hall there, and this individual only from the lower pelvis down. So we excavated him, uh, did the analysis, and left him in situ, so he's still there. So in 2003, also under the, uh, the foundations of Town Hall, this is the corner this time, we found this individual. Um, and this individual, because we didn't have enough of him, we couldn't definitively say he died in the back of town. But he's surrounded by individuals that were, because this 
Chai also have evidence of weapon trauma where all his skilled tool remains. And then in 2005, we were lucky enough to be allowed to permission to excavate under the dining room tap hall, and this is the first individual we found. And again, this is a, an east-west burial in the Christian Mammon. Individually buried, so as one would presume he's of higher status than those in the mass grave, but obviously we don't know that. And then next to him, there was a triple grave. One, two, three, and these are the skulls from these, the, those burials. And these, all these burials had a, evidence of significant weapon trauma on their skulls. Uh, which I've gone into before. So there's the mass grave from 1996. There's a 2002, 2003, half under the wall here. So their bodies are still under there. And then there's the 2005 excavation of the bodies, or rather skeletons, in the dining room. And uh, in 2005 as well, we did some exploratory work because we did this geophysical survey. And as we were carrying that, that survey at that location, we found I found two human teeth. So obviously, we excavated a four metre by one metre trench across that position, and we were looking for the mass graves from the Battle of Tap that were noted on this map by Jeffries in the mid 18th century. The graves in Tap Field. So that's what we're looking for. Found some human teeth. Did a test trench. Uh, in the summer of 2005, uh, you can see this uh, feature showing up on the side there. This side of the trench, there was nothing or very little. This side of the trench was absolutely full of human remains. Uh, there's a, a side view of the trench, so you see that this is the side of a pit. We didn't go to the bottom of the pit because it was a test trench, but we already knew what it was by then. Um, here are some of the, those are the locations of the human remains that we found just in that one metre square and there was over 300. Uh, and the longest, or the largest piece we found was a radius and ulna. Uh, we found some uh, semi-articulated hand bones, uh, semi-articulated spine bones. Uh, oops, sorry, let's go back to that one. Uh, Oh, there's the side of the trench, you see there's nothing there, and this side is absolutely full of human remains, including bits and pieces, fragments of skull, etc. They were all fragmentary, and they've all been exhumed before. And there's the actual trench going down to the bottom, or not, not to the bottom of the pit, but to the bottom of where we stopped. And here's some of the assemblages of the, of the human remains, as you can see, bits of everything. Apart from the vast majority of the big bits of the skull and any of the major long bones. Somebody had taken all the big bones out and left all these little ones behind. And we knew that this was on the orders of Richard III when he first became king in 1483. And they, he gave an order, and I think, I believe it was an order that his brother had already uh, given to clear the human remains from the battlefields of Tappan and put them in consecrated ground. Therefore, we've got some big pits that are only semi full of uh, human remains. Uh, these have been published uh, in uh, osteological reports, etc. Uh, and you can go and look at them whenever you want. Uh, it's available on the internet as well. Uh, this is from a medical um, manual, call it a medical manual, but it's basically how to repair people who have been in medieval battle. And these are official medical texts. And as you can see, there's just about everything. This poor chap is not one person, obviously. It's a representation of everybody. Uh, but this poor chap has obviously suffered a great deal. So there's everything from uh, puncture wounds and cut wounds and club wounds. But the, this one is dated 1495. And there's a significant lack of anything to do with firearms. And we see a similar manual a few years later in 1519. As you can see, very similar, slightly nicer drawing, we're into the Reformation period obviously. And then, um, but there's a significant difference, and that is, this incorporates uh, wounds from firearms. So we can see the development of firearms appearing on medieval battlefields. We know they appeared at Bosworth, but it was not something you would expect to die from, hence the first picture, which is after Bosworth. 
it's not something you'd expect to die from, so it's no big threat. They're throwing cannonballs around, but nobody's really that bothered about it <laughs> until the early 16th, uh, 16th century. And then suddenly it appears in the mantles. So that is something to consider with the uh, human remains, uh, Richard's human remains. But of course, as, unless somebody's found something that I don't know about, there, are no, there is no evidence of uh, firearms on Richard's skeleton. So again, it falls into the area of the earlier evidence rather than later. Now we go to Towton, and as you can see, the assemblage at Towton <coughs> took uh, a large number of, uh, a lot of evidence of the uh, weapon trauma on the human remains. So we've got, not unlike uh, some uh, from Richard, obviously, we've got slices straight across the face, we've got uh, war hammer injuries into the head, and stab wounds to the head. We've got healed injuries like this one from number 16, where he's significantly healed from an injury a few, at least a few years beforehand. Uh, we've got pole arms, uh, mace wounds. This one's number 16 again there from the front there. He is with his healed wound, but obviously he didn't, su he didn't uh, survive the, uh, the conflict of town. And then we've got this poor chap who's obviously quite elderly and starting to lose his teeth. And again, a significant weapon trauma. And the date range of most of these scaffolds is from about 1618 to the early 50s. So it's remarkably similar to what we would expect people to do uh, in, a, on a, in a war zone uh, today. Oops. And if you put all these injuries together, we get the puncture wounds from one set. Again, it's all been compiled onto one skeleton or one skull. Then we've got the sharp force trauma, and then we've got the blunt force trauma. And these shows a de general distribution of the wounds around uh, the skeletons as we found. And again, this has been published and, and updated, so we originally did the blood, 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 blood red roses in 2000. Uh, and this has uh, been updated by some of my colleagues and myself uh, in 2000. So again, that's available for uh, scrutiny. Uh, but also, we've got to look outside uh, Bosworth and we've got to look outside town because these wounds are remarkably similar across the full range of age, <coughs> and period, but also location. So you've got the Varus battle from 9 AD in Germany, and then you've got the Battle of Wittstock, also in Germany, but this one's 1636. But you're getting very, very similar uh, wounds. <coughs> Uh, we've got Anglo-Saxon evidence from the Battle of Chester, or possibly Chester, from uh, 616 AD. And again, you've got significant wounds, very, very similar, because what they're doing is they're using bladed weapons. And that used to be, until the development of firearms, that used to be the way of killing people. So it was close to hand-to-hand, -hand, and apart from archery, it was always close uh, combat. Uh, we've even got the victims from York, uh, the, from the Viking sort of period, um, and again, significant weapon trauma that matches it absolutely perfectly. And what we also see is that there are remar remarkable similarities between some of these wounds. So obviously we've got uh, the 7th, 11th century, we've got Uppsala from Sweden, 1520. But if you look at all these wounds, some of them are almost identical, and it's what happens when you attack a human being with a bladed weapon. And it's been happening for thousands of years. So until we invented the gun so we could do it at a bit of a distance, this is what people used to do to each other. And in some parts of the world, they still do, unfortunately. Because this is from Rwanda, from the genocide of 1994. And these people were also using bladed weapons. Not quite a sword, but it was more of a machete. Uh, and these are the injuries that can be expected from these weapons. Remarkably similar. Uh, one thing that this threw up, which is very interesting, a bit gruesome, but it's still very interesting, is that as horrible as these injuries are, sometimes you can survive them. And there are large numbers of people that survived horrendous injuries with machete. So, as horrible as it is, academically it's interesting because we cannot always assume that all these people that died in the Battle of Town, they didn't die from a single blade wound to the head. Because obviously we can see here, some people survived. 
so you can't take it for granted. So moving on to Richard, uh, obviously I put this in because he's obviously we're expecting Richard to be fully armed. He's the King of England, he should have the best arms and armour in the country. How accurate this is or not, we'll have to ask people like Toby uh, Capwell because he's an expert armour himself. But you get the general impression. So if you start looking at uh, Richard's uh, skeletal trauma, I think it's very interesting as a comparison. But some questions first. For example, if there is trauma on Richard's head, then why was he not wearing a helmet? Who in their right mind goes into a medieval conflict without a helmet when you've probably got the best helmets in the country, if not Europe? So that's a question that should be raised. Was he unprepared? Excuse me, you're about to be tapped, attacked by a group of individuals over there. Please put your helmet on. I don't think so, somehow. Uh, was he too hot in the middle of a combat? Uh, combat? My God, I've, I've got to take my helmet off. No, I don't think so. It's not the sort of thing you would want to do. I think I would have to be virtually passing out before I took my helmet off in the middle of this melee. Um, was he frustrated? Uh, was it due to frustration and rage? Well, obviously, with the end of Bosworth, if we're assuming this is near the end of Bosworth, then it sounds like a lot of things are going pear-shaped very rapidly. Uh, apparently Richard was not in the best of moods, so... But would you take the helmet off? Presumably not. One of the main reasons I think you would probably take your helmet off is, is because it was no good anymore. If it stopped you from seeing something, where am I fighting? <laughs> you take it off, because you're going to be dead within seconds. So, is that the reason? Some more questions. If his helmet had been removed, then who took it off? By Richard himself or by someone else? When was it removed? Before the battle? Don't think so. During the battle? Possibly but unlikely. Or after the conflict? Now a lot of people would have us believe that all this happened after the conflict. I think there's evidence to suggest that it was during the battle. Is it possible that he was still fighting after it was removed? Presumably not, but I think he was. Don't lynch me, it's only a theory. <laughs> so, we've got to go to the evidence. This is what we should be basing all this upon. So, we look at the historic documents first. Even though we hadn't before, even before they found him, Richard, they were still looking at the historic documents about what happened on that day. And it says in the Ballad of uh, Lady Bessie, a near contemporary source clearly states that Richard suffered head injuries during the battle. Quote, they struck his bassinet, his helmet, to his head until his brains came out with blood. I'm sorry, this is before dinner, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, came out with blood. It's quite descriptive, but not that descriptive. But the Frenchman John Molinet uh, wrote that, quote, one of the Welshmen, his Welshman turns up, one of the Welshmen then come after him and struck him dead with a halberd. Dating to around 1490, this is one of the, the few near contemporary accounts that mentions the weapon used to kill Richard. Are they telling the truth? Do they know? Was it a halberd? Why not a halberd? It's as good as anything else. So, but does this represent the full story? Was this the first blow with a halberd or whatever, uh, which might have brought Richard off his horse as he rode past, or was it the final death blow, or neither, or all of them? What does the evidence suggest? So let's look at the evidence. So we've got Richard's skull, and it's remarkably intact considering it's been uh, attacked by medieval weapons, and one of the, uh, the wounds that drew uh, I saw, I noticed a slightly significantly different, and that is it's an over, it's not a slit from a knife, as I'll show you in a minute. This is a, a rectangle, a small, <coughs> stubby rectangle. rectangle. Uh, so what's that due to? It could be something like a knife or something, or something else. Uh, for example, is he still wearing his helmet? Well, if he was, you could get a knife blade through that nice little crack there and potentially stab somebody in the face. So, we, don't, we still don't know. Is he wearing his helmet? Not sure. 
It's remarkably similar to the size and shape of the back spike of a halberd. Well, that, is that a coincidence? We talk about halberds. Was it first blow or last blow? We don't know, there's no way of telling. But it's interesting and that is not a typical knife blade, but it is a typical spike from that. Would kill him, would hurt a lot, and would draw a lot of blood, but it wouldn't kill him. Uh, and because it's slightly insignificant, the, 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 uh, the interest has been drawn away from that wound. If we compare it to Towton now, we can see that obviously we've got significant uh, holes in people's heads. For example, number nine here, we've got a significant square or sub rectangular hole or a diamond shaped. And basically, it looks like it is a top spike or a back spike of a warhammer. So basically, somebody goes like that, and that's what happens. You get a wound like that in your head. There's very few wounds on that skeleton. It looks like that was a blow that took him to the ground. Uh, and he was also finished off if he wasn't already dead by that time. Uh, we've got another warhammer or a mace or a maul injury, and that's a bigger hole round, and that's obviously something that ran, hit him very hard and popped the skull out from the, the side of the skeleton. Um, and as you can see, the skull is a very good indicator of the shape of the weapon that makes the hole. So something to bear in mind. And then we've got this one, which I think is very interesting because you look at that, it's actually rectangular. And that was the shape of the warhammer that brought this chap down uh, by a blow straight to the top of the head. Sub uh, sort of rectangular, very large, about that big. Uh, and if you go and compare these with weapons injuries to the Royal Army's weapons, you can see almost exactly what made this sort of injury. Um, it's also worth uh, noting that um, there's uh, another way of fighting called half swording and that is using the whole of the sword so if you haven't got a mace and you want to belt somebody very hard you turn your sword around and you belt them very hard and the weight of the sword is significant you can kill somebody by belting them significantly hard enough even when they're wearing a helmet now this is from a video and this chap almost accidentally knocked this guy out and he suffered a bit of compression because of it and obviously he wasn't trying to kill him so it's a significant weapon in however you use it either the sharp end or the blunt end and this is from the Talhofer uh, manuscript book of how to fight so this is how and you see there he's using his half swording techniques and that is using both hands on the sword so you hold the sword in a normal grip you'd also hold the other end with your gauntlet on and then you could direct it exactly, almost like a knife. <coughs> so some of the wounds that look like knife wounds could actually be sword wounds. Uh, and this is something to bear in mind. Did a significant blow temporarily stun Richard without leaving a mark on his skull? Well, we'll never know that. But it's something you've got to add into the equation just in case it might happen. So if somebody goes and belts Richard on the head, even if he is wearing a skull, it's going to concuss him slightly. Is there any evidence of it? No, of course there isn't. Um, then we look at Talhofer's uh, fight book again from 14, 1459, so just year, uh, two years before the war, uh, Battle of Town. It shows how to basically kill somebody if they are in a full suit of armour. And here they're projecting a knife through either the visor or the hole in the visor on both of these accounts. So two fully armoured knights, and this is how you're expected to dispatch somebody even if they're wearing full armour. We've got this individual from town, and it's a slashing wound to the front of the face. Basically, somebody's got the edge of a sword and it's gone like that, and it's just caught him. And this individual, when we excavated him here, all that still in place, completely cut off, but he's still in place. His teeth were still in place. Obviously, what had happened is he was killed straight away and before his body had even chance to fall to pieces, he was buried. So his guns and everything else must have been in place. And when we excavated it, the soil around there, all the teeth that were in place just fell down into the, uh, into the soil. So it's remarkable what the evidence you can collect uh, if you excavate these things properly. Uh, in terms of a sword blow from the side, uh, you're not going to get it through a visor 
And as this, hopefully, the next slide shows, you can't quite see it there. This is the same skull from the side. There's the solar blow to the front. You see there, it's got a nip on the jaw. So basically, the sword has gone in from this side. It's gone like that, shot the front of it, and it's stopped just as it hit, hit, hits the back of the jaw there. And if we compare this to Richard's, I'll just show that again for a second. See, so there's a little nick on the back of his jaw there. So if you compare this to Richard's skull, there are, oops, I don't mean to do that. There are nicks on his skull there and there from what look like superficial wounds, but are they part of something else that did, did significant damage to his flesh? And that's the only bit that shows on his skull. And again, here's another of, uh, victim from Tappan. Now remember, these are from the, not the mass grave from 1996, these are from the individual graves. So these, we can presume, are of slightly higher status. Or somebody took more care to inter these individuals than they did the people in the mass grave. Are they significantly better off? Higher uh, status? We don't know. But they were buried individually. And as you can see here, on the back, basically on the back of the jaw there, you feel your jaw the sword, a knife, or whatever it's called, it just nicked it. So, is that sword going, just missing them? Remember, it's got flesh on it, so it would open a, a, a large wound. And then there's another one, it's out in 111, there it is. Very similar nick, similar place on the back of his jaw. Now, uh, if the helmet on the visor was especially from behind, you go up to somebody and do that and then pull it up, it can do that with a knife or whatever. And as you can see from the hard saw, uh, the uh, fight manuals, this is one of the things you do. So if you lift the visor, you suddenly gain access to the whole of their face. So, any individual, any wound that's around there, we can't assume that he's still not wearing a helmet. He could still have been wearing a helmet and somebody's doing this to him. But, there are other wounds, hang on a minute. Uh, oh, also, yeah, I forgot. Um, this is the location of not only the helmet strap to keep his helmet on, but also the strap for, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, it's, uh, his helmet is uh, potentially still on there, but not just the helmet, but the beaver underneath, so it's his throat protection. And the strap that holds that on is down there as well. So imagine somebody comes in, they've overpowered Richard, and you want his helmet off. So if somebody goes in with a knife and does that, then you're gonna get cuts all around certain places. I'm not saying this is what happened, but this is one of the things we've got to take into consideration. So is it possible that the visor was damaged and he could not lift it to see clearly? So if somebody belts him in the front of the visor and he's charging across the battlefield, all it takes is some crazy Welshman with a 10 foot Halbert to go, I think that's the king, belt. Now if that hit him right in the face, it might have completely dented his visor. In which case, he's wandering around the battlefield and he can't lift his visor up. So, if he can't lift his visor up, do you wander around? It's a balancing act, isn't it? Do I want to keep my helmet on and I can't see? Or do I just think, I can't see a thing, I'm taking my helmet off? I don't know, but it's something to bear in mind because we've got to consider that his helmet is now about to come off. He might therefore remove his own helmet, in which case he would be alive after he removed his helmet. Is there any evidence that Richard was alive after he'd taken his helmet off? I think there is. Presumably he would have had to be too busy to get another helmet. If your helmet's damaged, and you go fling it, I'm being attacked by the whole of the Cashier Army, Excuse me, you, give me your helmet. Well, if he's already in the middle of a fight, this guy's going to go, I don't think so. <laughs> so, does he want another helmet? Presumably he does. Does he get one? Presumably not. Because if you look at this injury here, this is an attack on the skull that's virtually missed. So, there's a skull in front of me, Rich is dead or whatever. I'm suddenly, well, I'm, why am I attacking him? He's already dead or incapacitated. So I could be doing this and trying to get him, but he's moving his head. 
Uh, how do you get that wound if he's moving his head? If he's got a helmet on. So it looks like the head's moving around, but he's not wearing a helmet. Also, there's this wound on the top of the head. He's not wearing a helmet. Why is somebody attacking him twice with two different weapons when he's presumably already dead? But why are they attacking him with two different weapons? He's not, well, I don't think he's already dead. Unless, of course, it's some sort of insult injury, in which case, why should they almost miss it? Evidence suggests that a glancing blow from a very sharp bladed weapon, possibly on a non static target. If Richard was dead and not moving, then why did somebody strike him in the first place? And even then, almost miss. Uh, possibly still facts at all. I'm not saying it's yes or no, I'm just saying it's a possibility that we've got to bear in mind. So he's possibly still fighting if he's still moving around. But he's not wearing a helmet, that's one thing for sure at this stage. And if we look to other assemblages, we've got the Battle of Visby from 1361. And again, we've got another attack wound identical to that from uh, uh, on Richard. And again, it's just a glancing blow, which would have somebody obviously is attacking his head and just moved at the last minute and it ricochets off his head. Also, um, you can survive these incredibly easily. There would be a lot of blood and you've been a big chunk of your head taken, taken off the scalp. But as this gentleman unfortunately shows, that you can actually scalp most of the head and you still survive. So it's going to be bleeding a lot, but it's not fatal. And then of course we'll look at Richard and then the top of the head has got this, uh, I think that's the top of the head, I can't quite see it from this one. We've got, that's the external view, and this is the internal view. And as you can see, most knife blades, or even the end of a very sharp sword, have got this very thin, <coughs> elongated blade wound that seems to occur over and over again. And presumably it's something like a dagger, or a, a sword, or even a very sharp blade on the end of a pole arm, such as a halberd, for example. But it'd have to be a very thin knife blade. Okay. And again, the tap, you've got these very distinctive puncture wounds that are always almost square, so they're a lot broader than a knife blade. So we're, we're talking about significant difference in weapons. And again, sometimes uh, these wounds have got uh, not just one, but two in the same place. So somebody's obviously doing this with a dagger, or they're doing, they've got a war hammer and belting them once or twice. So we don't this gentleman said, you know, sometimes you don't stop, even though your one blow is probably enough. But, so again, we don't know. Uh, but one thing that's important is they're not necessarily fatal at that time. Eventually, maybe due to blood loss, possibly, but not on, on the day. And then we've got Richard Famous wound, which I'm not even going to go into, which obviously is the, uh, the, the, the puncture wound onto the pelvis where a knife blade has come into the, uh, the pelvis and significantly scarred it. And all I'll say here is that there are other, uh, sorry, that's the interpretation from the, uh, the team that did the Ricardian uh, assemblage, or uh, the skeleton, uh, that it was a, a puncture wound while he was lying over the horse. But uh, it's worth pointing out that this is one of the least armoured places of the body. Why? Because he's got to sit on the horse. We know that Richard would have had the horse. So even though he's fully armoured, there are places where it is at least less armoured. Is that what happened? We don't know. Uh, but looking at other assemblages, for attack, for example, we see this is a knife blade again, uh, and it's a blade wound to the pelvis. Uh, very distinctive. So other people are attacking people. It's not just the head going forward, going forward. And here's a victim from the Battle of Good Friday in 1520, and again you see the stab wound to the pelvis. So they're going for certain parts of the body, presumably either the weaker parts or the bits that are not armoured. And it's coincidence that they're around the back side, so is it on the front or the back, etc. So, uh, and we've also got on the Richard skeleton, we've got a cut to the ribs. And again, everybody is saying you have to have uh, the armour removed, and I would say we have to be careful because if you look at the armour, again using this example from the bottom of the back, 
This again is one of the few places that's not fully armoured with plate. And it's, even though it's got mail on it, uh, you can get a knife through mail. So, is that what happened? Again, we don't know. But, Talhofer's fight manual from 1459 tells you exactly what to do, and that is stick something like a blade exactly there, or into the face, as we saw before. So, this uh, Talhofer's manual is very useful because it's telling you how to kill a fully armoured knight. And again, uh, the mortal wound, as people say on Richard's uh, skull, is the big open wound on the back of the skull, uh, on the rear of the cranium. And it's almost certainly not wearing a helmet, but if it is, it's been pulled right forward, so the whole of his neck is exposed, which is possible, but it's more unlikely. It looks like at this point he's dying because he's not wearing a helmet. And it could be from the, uh, there's that top spike, which is like a knife blade, it could be from the chopping action of basically it's a, an axe on a long pole, or it could be from the sharp blade of a sword. Again, we don't know. Uh, but we have got direct comparisons from town, from various skulls, where they've opened up significant amounts of the head due to these huge slashing wounds. So this is what they're going for. They are going for the head because one good blow to the head will take them out almost immediately. Uh, and again, it looks like probably the, uh, the coup de grace on, uh, on Richard's skeleton where there's this uh, significant long blade wound has gone not only through the skull, but I think I'm right in believing that there was, you probably know the skull. Did it, I think it actually touched the other end, didn't it? I think it actually touched the other side of the skull back there as another scratch. So that went right through the skull and stopped at the other side. And again, that's presumably what they're doing, although it's from slightly more from the side, uh, as you see there. Uh, but presumably, if you've managed to chop at Richard's head like that, then especially using hard sorting, it would be a chop, stab, and that's how you finish people off. Uh, then we're going to move on to the next one. And this is how they learn to fight in the medical field. And again, in town, we've got a very similar injury. Stab wound to the side of the head. Looks like it finished him off and it went straight through into the brain cavity. And again, it could be something from a knife, a sword, or the top of a, a halberd. We don't know. So, uh, if we try to condense all this and synthesize it, uh, we've got... Oh, sorry. We've got the initial wound. I'm calling the initial one off, so we've no way of knowing whether that's the first or the last wound, so we don't know. But we've got a significantly different wound. For some reason, it's, it looks out of place. It's not a broad warhammer wound like a lot from town. It's very small and very similar in cross-section to something like that. So was that the halberd wound that initially struck Richard? Because imagine if you got that and somebody's just passing you and you go, woof, hit them in the head, jams in the helmet, pulls him off, he's off his horse, you've damaged his helmet, and he's wandering around going, what's going on? All his retainers jump on you, jump on him, and try to protect him. But the next thing is, it looks like, I would suggest, him somebody, or he took his helmet off, because a lot of the wounds afterwards look like they're not, he's not wearing a helmet. And again, looking at Talhofer's manual, uh, this is the half sorting. Uh, and again, I would suggest that a lot of these later injuries could be inflicted either by the sword or something like the halberd with the top spike that's like a knife blade on it, which is a glorified spear, basically. So, weapon two, it's probably something like a sword uh, or something very similar, a long, thin bladed weapon. So, um, ah, the top bit I can't see, but this, this one, uh, I've put this down, I'm, I'm going to be quoted to death about this, so I'm going to write it down. So I'm not misquoted. Right, this is one one of millions of potential interpretations, but it's worth considering because it all seems to fit the evidence, the available evidence. So, was Richard attacked while riding past someone with a halberd, a backspike? Uh, knocking or pulling him from his horse, if he struck him in the face, 
from a different shaped wound, it might have damaged his visor, leaving him, him unable to see or to raise his visor. What do you do? Get the thing off so you can see. He might then have removed his own helmet if he could not raise the visor. He might have had no choice. If someone else removed his helmet, then why does it appear that Richard was able to keep fighting? It does look like he's still moving his head after someone or he had removed his helmet. He and his bodyguards might then have fought new attackers, one or more of whom might have been armed with a sword. This fight might not have involved a single uh, blow, but many using single combat techniques such as uh, uh, half swording as knights would have been trained to use, thereby sustaining several, several non-fatal injuries. He might then have sustained one or two mortal blows in quick succession, especially the big two ones, uh, the big ones at the back of the skull. First, a strike to the back of the skull with the edge of a sword or the blade from a halberd, etc. And then the final stab to the skull to kill him off. This is what people did in medieval combat. For this interpretation of the evidence, there need only have been two different types of weapons a halberd for the initial strike and a different wound. People didn't generally fight close on with a halberd, it's too big. You can't do this when somebody's next to you with a blade of weapon that's 10 feet long. So those are the implements of the men at arms that are around, you know, killing at a slight uh, increased distance. Uh, might then have been removed and a sword to fight the killer. So again, it's worth considering. I'm not saying this is the interpretation that everybody should stick to, it's just a possibility. This interpretation incorporates most of the available evidence, or rather, potentially it doesn't contradict it. So, is the archaeological evidence of weapon trauma on Richard's skeleton significantly different to that of other medieval battle victims? That is the original question, obviously. And the answer is, there are remarkable similarities between all of the wounds on Richard's skeleton and those of other medieval battle combatants. Which is weird, because he's the King of England. However, with him being the King of England, with the very best armour available, and obviously his retainers looking after him, surely this was not to be expected. As the archaeological evidence of medieval conflict now clearly illustrates, even given the best armour of the day, there is now physical evidence that it was still possible to be able to kill a king on a medieval battlefield in a manner similar to that of everyone else. The death of King Richard III, final questions. Now these are aimed at you guys, so if you talk about something over your lunch, <laughs> uh, please don't hang me for it. Did Richard only die on that day simply because, for some reason, he was not wearing his helmet? It's quite, quite strong evidence. Would Richard have survived if he had retained his helmet? That's something to consider. If he hadn't lost, taken his helmet off for some reason, would King Richard III have uh, survived that battle? Would Henry Tudor ever have become king? Well, potentially not. If Richard's not dead, then that's a whole different ballgame. Did a single blow from a Welshman... Oh, there's no Welsh in the room today. <laughs> Did a single blow from a Welshman with a halberd change the course of English history and so end the Yorkist dynasty? We can only speculate. I don't think that's me done. Thank you very much.